Joining us now is a lecturer at the University of Michigan, lecturing in Ukrainian and Slavic languages, and also is part of the U uh, Ukrainian American Crisis Response Committee of Michigan. Eugene Bodorenko joins us now on the Megacast. Eugene, thank you for being with us. Thank you for taking the time to speak to me. Appreciate having you on. So first, um, can you tell us about the work of the crisis response team that, that you're part of, the U Ukrainian American Crisis Response Team of Michigan, and the role that it's playing in working with our leadership here in Michigan and 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 in the U.S. to address the the truly harrowing situation over in Ukraine with the invasion from Russia. Yeah. So uh, the Detroit area has a Ukrainian community that is about 50,000 strong, uh, not to mention um, that in general, you know, we have received a lot of support from people completely outside of our community because I think that the situation is appalling and, uh, you know, it's the biggest I think it's the biggest crime into the international on the international world stage since 1939. Um, but to get to your question, um, the Ukrainian community here and this organization, which is essentially the uh, uh, the entire the work of the entire community coming together, um, we're engaged in advocacy. Uh, so trying to get the word out about what is going on. Um, once again, trying to stay ahead of that um, Kremlin propaganda narrative. Uh, we also organize uh, within the community to to um, help with some humanitarian aid, um, such as medical supplies and things of that nature. Um, uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, we uh, at this point are uh, having to seriously discuss uh, mass numbers of refugees. Yeah, refugee is certainly going to be the big humanitarian question going forward in, in the interim and in the immediate because of the situation over there in Ukraine where Russia has been able to make ground quite quickly uh, from its initial onslaught that began about 9.30 p.m. On Wednesday, on Wednesday evening here in the U.S., which was early Thursday morning local time in Ukraine, and especially as they're pushing toward the capital of Ukraine in Kyiv. Um, but in, in terms of those that are there, that are in Ukraine right now, being that we have such a strong Ukrainian population here where they have friends, they have family, that have other people that are in their lives over in Ukraine, we hear so much about the Ukrainian perspective from the military side of things, dealing with the Russian invasion. For those individual, everyday humans that aren't in the military but are living in Ukraine and are living in these cities that are being attacked, what has your committee and the Ukrainian com community here in the metro Detroit area in the state of Michigan heard from those on the front lines over there in Ukraine about just how treacherous the situation is in the homeland? Well, look, um it's no uh, it's no secret that the Russian military is not discriminant in what it shells and what it bombs. Um, the uh, initial sense of disbelief that this is happening has given way to anger and determination um, or increased determination since it was always there. Um, uh, folks, you know, I'm from Kyiv, so people are uh, spending a lot of their day uh, in the subway, which is a bomb, which is designed also as an air raid shelter. Um, it's quite an expansive system, and a lot of people can fit down there. Um, air raid sirens are, you know, can be easily heard. There has been direct bombing of Kyiv, um, actually two cruise missiles in a plane uh, attempted to strike targets somewhere in central Kiev. We're not sure where because Ukrainian anti-air defenses knocked them down. Um, but you can imagine that for civilians living in such a situation, I mean, it, the, the, the goal is survival, right? Um, right now, it's collective survival. People are absolutely livid at what is going on. Um, I think that there has been a lot of, you know, from the Russian side, there's a lot of talk of our common cultural ancestry and whatever. I think that whatever grain of something remotely to truth was there before, it has certainly gone now. 
nobody, no, no, nobody in any Eastern Ukrainian city, no matter how much how pro-Russian they were, uh, is going to ever forget being bombed and shelled in the middle of the night. Um, and uh, it's simply a wanton act of aggression. And a lot of, you know, when I say 1939, Ukrainians are very well versed in the history of the 20th century. You know, Ukraine suffered about 8 million deaths during World War II. Um, so the, uh, you, you know, it's when we say 1939, the, the people know what that means. We're joined by Eugene Bodorenko, U of M lecturer in Ukrainian and Slavic languages as well as, and, and literatures, as well as part of the Ukrainian American Crisis Response Committee of Michigan, joining us on the Megacast. And so at, in the committee's discussions with the, with the community here in the state of Michigan, with our leadership uh, in Michigan at the state level and at the, and at the federal level, uh, and, and seeing the response and in, the initial response from the federal government yesterday with President Biden announcing a sweeping financial sanctions on uh, the Russian government and those in power in Russia, not specifically Vladimir Putin's finances, which was a part, part of the criticism of those sanctions. In addition to those sanctions, is there anything else that's being discussed in terms of providing additional aid to those on the front lines in Ukraine trying to ward off this unprovoked attack from Vladimir Putin's cronies in Russia? Yeah. So the uh, I mean, you know, it's first of all, let me say it's it is Vladimir Putin's cronies in Russia and it's not necessarily the, the Russian people. Right. Yes. But let's be clear that they've been Putin has been in power for 20 years and has has been quite popular. So I think there there is a degree of culpability that Russia as a state bears, not just Putin and his administration. Um, uh, but the uh, in terms of what can be done, right um look the sanctions were and should have been to a rational you know actor in putin's place um should have been in deterrence enough at this point punitive sanctions are definitely the right way to go i mean it's incredibly important to make uh first of all the russian elite but also just the average russian citizen feel the consequences of their country going out of going way out of bounds of uh, of international law right i i really urge us that we, we had no qualms cutting off trade with germany after its invasion of poland right we had no qualms about any of this and i don't think we should either uh in this case furthermore to help people on the front lines look sanctions are great but they're clearly not enough at this point and unfortunately, it, it is my professional opinion that we live in a moment where we are looking a big conflict, where a big conflict is staring us in the face with Russia, right? And the longer it takes for us to look up and admit that reality, the longer, the, the worse the, uh, the outcome may be. Uh, I really think that it's time that we use the U.S. Air Force uh, cruise missiles and drones to take out Russian targets within Ukraine. Uh, I think that military action is the only thing that will stop Putin at this point. Uh, the Ukrainians are putting up a hell of a fight. And uh, it, to me, if nothing is done, it would be as if in 1939, the world just sort of looked at Hitler invading Poland and said, oh, OK, right? We, uh, it's it's an uncomfortable thing to say, and I'm not hawkish. I've never advocated for war or invasion in my life. I, I in fact, I've been rather happy to be able to do without for most of my life. Um, uh, but uh, I, I believe that this is one of those moments where push has come to shove and we have to stand up. We're speaking with Eugene Bodorenko, U of M lecturer in Ukrainian and Slavic languages and literature, as well as part of the Ukrainian American Crisis Response Team of uh, Crisis Response Committee of Michigan, joining us on the MegaCast. Uh, you know, we see the images that are coming in from our our national news outlets here in the United States, from national news outlets in, in other allied countries, in NATO and surrounding 
uh, Ukraine and even from a uh, video from in Ukraine from soldiers and those and citizens through social media and we see the extent of these attacks the brutality of the attacks just thus far as Russia is in putting in their initial strategic attacks while also of course having massive collateral damage in major cities all across Ukraine we we see that as so as very severe we know that the support from neighboring nations particularly from NATO nations immediately bordering Ukraine and bordering Russia has not has not been as you know, to your satisfaction certainly not to those uh, the satisfaction of those in Ukraine, but the Ukrainians are fighting back. The Ukrainians are willing to lay their lives on the line for their country, for their neighbors. That being said, the Russian military is one of the more powerful, one of the handful of most powerful militaries in the entire world. Are the Ukrainian people on the front lines confident from what you have discussed with them that they can ward this off long enough to have that international support before time runs out and the Russians overtake that their nation, their country? You know, it's a, it's a, I'm really glad you asked that question. Um, I want to, if you, in, in 1941, Winston Churchill gave, uh, I'm sorry, not in 1941, uh, during the Blitz, Winston Churchill gave a speech in which he said, you know, we will fight on the beaches we will fight on the landing zones. We will fight on the. We will fight in the streets. We will fight in the fields. Right. I'm paraphrasing here. Yeah. We'll never surrender, and that is the average Ukrainian fighter's outlook. I most people in Ukraine. You have to understand there is no Plan B. There is no backup country to go to. the The sense is is that if Russia comes in and they complete their military objectives, they will go about. Uh, basically purging the Ukrainian cultural, e political, and economic elite uh, to basically put Ukraine into a position of an entirely dependent client state like Belarus to the north. Um, so in this regard, you know, Ukrainians really have appreciated what they've seen as the stark contrast between their country where they have elections every five years to you know, to, to see if, the, and, and we have, they've had, I mean, <laughs> to, to give you the vibrance of Ukrainian elections, I mean, they've, there's only been one two-term president over the last, uh, over, over, <laughs> over, the, over its entire existence. So the political climate is quite vibrant. Compare this to Belarus, which has had the strongman leader since 1994, when I was six years old, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, Putin, who has been in power since 2000, Ukrainians see this, and Ukrainians see the um, the kind of civic, un, well, the lack of civic freedoms that increasingly is the case in Russia and Belarus. I mean, right, uh, uh, versus the sorts of freedoms that they have, have been allowed to have, and they they will fight tooth and nail and to the death. The question is, it, the question isn't can they hold out. The question is how many more have to die before we do something. We're joined by Eugene Bodorenko, U of M lecturer in Ukrainian and Slavic languages and literatures, and part of the Ukrainian American Crisis Response Committee of Michigan. And as we are looking on, uh, Ukrainian Americans and other Americans as well are looking on in, in horror at the actions of the Russian government at this at this barbaric invasion of a sovereign nation of uh, in Ukraine and seeing the damage that's being inflicted on the cities, the death toll that continues to increase by the hour amongst amongst military in Ukraine and average everyday citizens in Ukraine as well. Much like with other tragedies where there is a mass amount of death, the immediate response tends to be a lot of thought, a lot of we're thinking of you, our hearts are with you, our thoughts and prayers are with you. And like you said, but like you said earlier, so many have already come to the to the right hand and left in the left hand side of the Ukrainian American community to offer their support at this time from your committee, from your from your friends and neighbors in the Ukrainian community, in the Ukrainian American community here in Michigan. What can we do as your neighbors, as your friends, as your as your colleagues, as strangers that just want to do whatever they can to help at this time, to help your committee push forward in the American response to what's going on in Ukraine? Look, I think the important thing 
here for the average American is to understand the moment that we are living in, right? Um, we do appreciate all of the support when people do say that they are praying for us, that they're thinking of us. Look, this does, of course, matter a great deal. I, I, I'm not, I will not say anything to disparage that. And I'm touched by the number of people that have reached out to me. Um, at the same time, uh, I would urge them to add to this writing to their elected representatives and saying that, look, we should send humanitarian assistance and we should continue to send military aid, but please send our planes and our missiles. Eugene, just because, not, yeah, well, please continue. Please, because if there was ever a morally justified time to intervene and a morally necessary time to intervene, it is now. We're joined by Eugene Bodorenko. You have the lecturer in Ukrainian and Slavic languages and literature on the Megacast. He's also part of the Ukrainian American Crisis Response Committee of Michigan. Eugene, uh, just a few more minutes before we will need to say goodbye today. Anything else that you would like to say at this moment in time on uh, what on the war that is under that's being undertaken in Ukraine, on the American response, or anything else about Ukraine to the public here in Michigan? Yeah, I just want to remind everyone that. You know, Ukraine has is a country that is played by the rules of the international community the whole time. They, upon declaring independence, they immediately committed to getting rid of what was the third, the world's third largest nuclear arsenal. They did so entirely um, in exchange for uh, not a treaty guarantee, but a guarantee of the recognition of their borders, which have been violated, you know, uh, without any regard. Um, Ukraine has consistently put itself through several through several su successive administrations has kept a westward course. It is in the Ukrainian constitution. It is inscribed in the Ukrainian constitution that that Ukraine uh, seeks to join the EU and NATO. They are a Western society. Ukrainians being bombed. Right. If 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 you think that this is a Ukraine Russia thing, this is no different from France being bombed, from Germany being bombed, from any place in Europe. This is a European country, and as much as Vladimir Putin doesn't want to think it and doesn't want to admit it, he is currently at war with Europe, and he's at war with the democratic world, and it is imperative and. And it is imperative that we help Ukraine by any means necessary. It would be a generational mistake not to. Eugene, thank you very much for joining us uh, and discussing a very complicated issue that's affecting not just those uh, in Ukraine, but their friends, their family, uh, and others in their life right here in Michigan. Appreciate your time. Thank you. And thank you for having me on the program. I, uh, you know, I thank you very much.